Good morning, friends. And just to think that we had dreamed of resting and loosening up a bit in port, after being squashed and doubled up for several days in the stoli pin, how we had dreamed of the transit prison, that we could stretch out a bit there and straighten up, that we, were, that we would be able to go to the toilet there without hurrying, that we would drink as much water there as we wanted and get as much hot water for tea, that there wouldn't be that there we wouldn't be forced to ransom our own bread rations from the convoy with our own belongings, that we would be fed hot food there, and that at last we would be taken to the bath, that we could drench ourselves in hot water and stop itching. We had had elbows stuck into our sides and been tossed from side to side in the Black Maria, and they had shouted at us, Link arms, take hold of your heels. But we were in good spirits anyway. It was all right, all right. Soon we'd, we would be at the transit prison, and now we were there. And even if some part of our dreams came true in the transit prison, something else would foul it all up anyway. What awaits us in the bath? We can never be sure. They begin suddenly to shave all the women's hair off in Krasnaya Presnya in November 1950, or in a line of us naked men as, or in a line of us naked men as clipped by women barbers only. In the Vol in the Vologda steam room, portly Aunt Matya used to shout, Stand up, men! and she'd let the whole line have it with the steam pipe. And the Irkutsk transcript, transit prison argued differently. It's more natural for the entire service staff in the bath to be male and for a man to smear on the medicinal tar ointment between the women's legs. Or during the winter, in the cold soaping-up room of the Novosibirsk transit prison, only cold water goes from the faucets. The prisoners make up their minds to ask higher-ups, and a captain comes, puts his own hand unfastidiously under a faucet, I say this water is hot, get it? I have already wearied of reporting that there are baths which have no water at all, that they scorch clothes in the roaster, that after the bath they compel people to run naked and barefoot through the snow to get their things. The counterintelligence of the second Bielorussian Bio front in Brodnica in 1945. From your very first steps in the transit prison, you realized that here you were not in the hands of the jailers or the officers of the prison administration, who at least adhere some of the time to some kind of written law. Here, you are in the hands of the trustees. That surely, that surly, that surly bath attendant who comes to meet your prisoner tra transport. Well, go wash, gentlemen fascists. And that works, and that work assignment clerk with a plywood writing board who looks over your formation searchingly and hurries you up and that instructor, clean-shaven except for a prominent forelock, who slaps his leg with that rolled-up newspaper and at the same time gives your bags a once-over. And then other transit prison trustees, whom you don't recognize, penetrate your suitcases with X-ray eyes. Oh, how alike they all are. And where, in your brief prisoner transport journey, have you seen them all before? Not so clean-looking, not so well-washed, but the same kind of ugly mug swine with pitiless, bare-toothed grins. Bah! These are the same blackening the thieves again, those same irky crooks whom Leonid Uchasov glorifies in his songs. And here again are Zinka Zogal, Zeryoga Zver, and Dimka Kish Kishkenya. But not behind bars this time. They have cleaned up, dressed up as representatives of the state, and putting on airs of great importance, they see to it that discipline is observed by us. But if one peers into those snouts, one can even, with imagination, picture that they spring from, some, from the same Russian roots as the rest of us. That once upon a time they were village boys whose fathers bore such names as Klim, Prokor, Gur, Guri, and that their general structure is even similar to our own, two nostrils, two irises in the eyes, a rosy tongue with which to swallow food, and utter certain Russian sounds which, however, shape totally new words. Every chief of a trans. trans transit prison has enough presence of mind to realize that he can send his relatives back home the wages for all staff positions or else he can divvy them up with the other prison officers and all you have to do is whistle to get as many volunteers as you want from among the socially friendly prison elements to carry out all that work just in return for being allowed to cast anchor at the transit prison and not have to go to it into a mine or to the tia or to the tega all these work assignment clerks, office clerks, bookkeepers, instructors, bath attendants, barbers, stockroom clerks, cooks, dishwashers, laundresses, tailors who repair underwear and linens are permanent transit prison residents. They receive prison rations and are registered in cells, and they swipe the rest of their soup and chow 
soup and chow on their own out of the common food pot or out of the bundle of the transit sex. All these transit prison trustees regard it as certain that they will never be better off in any camp. We arrive in their we arrive in their hands still not completely plucked, and they bamboozle us to their heart's content. It is they and not the jailers who search us and our belongings here, and before the search they suggest we in turn we turn in our money for safe keeping, and they seriously write down a list. We never see the list or the money again. We turned in our money. Who to? The officer who has arrived on the scene asks in surprise. Well, it was one of them. Who exactly? The trustees hadn't noticed which one. Why did you turn it over to him? We thought. That's what the turkey thought. Think less and you'll be better off. And that's that. They suggest we leave our things in the vestibule to the bath. No one's going to take them. Who needs them? We leave them. For after all, we can't take them into the bath with us anyway. We return and there are no sweaters left and no fur-lined mittens. What kind of sweater was it? Grayish. Well, that means it went to the laundry. They also take things from us honestly in return for taking a suitcase into the storage room for safekeeping, for putting us in a cell without the thieves, or sending us off on prisoner transports as soon as possible, for not sending us off as long as possible. The only thing they don't do is rob us by main force out in the open. But those aren't thieves, the connoisseurs among us explain. These are the bitches, the one, the ones who work for the prison. They're enemies of the honest thieves, and the honest thieves are the ones imprisoned in cells. But somehow this is hard for our rabbity, rabbity brains to grasp. Their ways are the same. They have the same kind of tattoos. Maybe they really are enemies of those others, and after all, they are not our friends either. That's how it is. By this time, they have forced us to sit down in the yard right underneath the cell windows. The windows all have muzzles on them, and you can't look in. But from inside, hoarse, friendly voices advise, Hey, fellows, you know what they do here. When they search you, they take away everything loose like tea and tobacco. If you have any, toss it in here, through our window. We'll give it back later. So what do you do? So what do you know? We are suckers and rabbits. Maybe they do take tea and tobacco away. We have read about universal prisoner solidarity in all our great literature. That one prisoner won't deceive another. The way they spoke to us was friendly. Hey, fellows. So we toss them our tobacco pouches, and the genuine purebred thieves on the other side catch them and guffaw, you fascist stoops. And here are the slogans which, with which the whole transit prison welcomes, welcomes us, even though they don't actually hang them on the walls. Don't look for justice here. You're going to have to hand up... Hand over everything you've got to us. You'll have to give it all up. This is repeated to you by the jailers, the convoy, and the thieves. You are overwhelmed by your unbearable prison term, and you are trying to figure out how to catch your breath, while everyone around you is figuring out how to plunder you. Everything works out so, it, so as to oppress the political prisoner, who is already depressed and abandoned without all that. You'll have to give it all up. The jailer at the Gorky Transit Prison shakes his head hopelessly, and with a sense of relief, Hans Bernstein. Bernstein gives him his officer's great coat, not free, but in exchange for two onions. And why should you complain about the thieves if you see all the jailers at Krasnaya Presnya wearing chrome leather boots? They, are, they were never issued. They were all lifted by the thieves in the cells and then pushed to the jailers. Why complain about the thieves if the instructor of the cultural cultural and educational department of the camp administration is a blotnoy, a thief himself, and writes reports on the politicals, the chem transit prison. And how are you ever going to get justice against the thieves in the Rostov transit prison when this is their ancient native tribal den? They say that in 1942 at the Gorky transit prison, some officer prisoners, including Gavrilov, the military engineer, Shepetin, and others, Nonetheless, rebelled, beat up the thieves, and forced them to stay in line. But this is always regarded as a legend. Did the thieves capitulate in just one of the cells for long? And how was it that the blue caps allowed the socially hostile elements to beat up the socially friendly ones? And when they say that at the Kotlas Transit Prison in 1940, the thieves started to grab money right out of the hands of the politicals lined up at the commissary. And the politicals began to beat them up so badly that they couldn't be stopped. And the peri perimeter guards entered the compound with machine guns to defend the thieves. Now there's something that rings true. That's the way it really was. Foolish relatives. They dash about in freedom, borrow money because they never have that kind of money at home, and send you foodstuffs and things. The widow's might, but also a poisoned gift because it transforms you from a free, though hungry person into one who is anxious and cowardly. And it deprives you of that newly dawning enlightenment, enlightenment, that 
toughening resolve, which are all you need for your descent into the abyss. Oh, wise gospel saying about the camel and the eye of the needle, these material things will keep you from entering the heavenly kingdom of the liberated spirit. <laughs> and you see that others in the police fan have the same kind of bags as you, ragbag bastards. The thieves have already snarled at you in the Black Maria. And those were only two of them. And there were fifty of you, and so far they haven't touched you. And now they were holding us for the second day in the Krasna Krasnaya Presnia station, with our legs tucked beneath us in the dirty floor because we were so crowded. However, none of us was observing the life going on around us because we were all too concerned with how to turn in our suitcases for safekeeping. Even though we were supposed to have the right to turn in our things for safekeeping, nonetheless, the only reason the work assignment clerks permitted us to do it was because the prison was a Moscow prison, and we ourselves hadn't yet lost our Moscow look. What a relief! Our things had been checked. And that meant we would have to give them up, not at this transit prison, but later on. The only things left dangling from our hands were our bundles with our ill-fated foodstuffs. Too many of us beavers had been assembled in one place. They began to distribute us among different cells. I was shoved into a cell with that same Valentin, who I, whom I had been with the day I signed for my OSO sentence, and who had proposed with touching sentiment that we begin a new life in camp. It was not yet packed full. The aisle was free. There was plenty of space under the bunks. According to the traditional arrangement, the thieves occupied the second tier of bunks. Their senior members were beside the windows, their juniors further back. A neutral gray mass was on the lower bunks. No one attacked us. Without looking around and without thinking ahead, inexperienced as we were, we sat down on the asphalt floor and crawled under the bunks. We would even be cozy there. The bunks were low for big men to get under, and we had to slide in on our bellies, inching along the asphalt floor. We did and we were going to lie there quietly and talk quietly. Not a chance. In the semi-darkness, with a wordless rustling from all sides, juveniles crept up, crept up on us on all fours like big rats. They were still boys, some twelve-year-olds, some twelve-year-olds even, but the criminal code accepted them too. They had already been processed through a thieves' trial, and they were continuing their apprenticeship with the thieves here. They had been unleashed on us. They jumped us from all sides, and six pairs of hands stripped from us and wrenched from us, from under us, all our wealth. And all this took place in total silence, with only the sound of sin sinister sniffing. And we were trapped. We couldn't get up. We couldn't move. It took no more than a minute for them to seize the bundles with the fat bacon, sugar, and bread. They were gone. We lay there feeling stupid. We had given up our food without a fight, and we could... And we could go on lying there now, but that was utterly impossible. Creeping out awkwardly, rear ends first. We got up from under the bunks. Am I a coward? I had thought I wasn't one. I had pushed my way into the heart of a bombing in the open step. I hadn't been afraid to drive over a trail, obviously mined with anti-tank mines. I had remained cool-headed when I had led my battery out of, out of encirclement and went back in for a damaged command car. Why, then, at that moment, didn't I grab one of those human rats and grate his rosy face in the black asphalt? Was he too small? Well, then, go for their leaders. But no. At the front, we are strengthened by some kind of supplementary awareness, and quite false, too, perhaps. It is, a sen is it a sense of our military unity, the sense of being in the right place at the right time, of duty? But in this new situation, nothing is clear. There are no rules, and everything has to be learned by feel. Getting to my feet, I turned to their senior, the Pakan, the ringleader of the thieves. All the stolen victual victuals were there in front of him beside the window on the second tier of bunks. The, ju the juvenile rats hadn't eaten a thing themselves. They were disciplined. Nature had sculpted the front part of the ringleader's head in bipeds usually called a face, with nausea and hate. Or perhaps it had come to be what was from living the life of a beast of prey. It sagged crookedly and loosely with a low forehead, a savage scar, and modern steel crowns on the front teeth. His little eyes were exactly large enough to see all familiar objects and yet not take delight in the beauties of the world. He looked at me as a boar looks at a deer, knowing he could always knock me off my feet. He was waiting, and what did I do? Leap forward to smash my fist into that ugly mug at least once and then go down in the aisle? Alas, I did not. Am I a scoundrel? Until that moment, I had always thought that I wasn't. But now, plundered and humiliated... I found it offensive to get down flat on my stomach again and crawl back beneath the bunks, and so I addressed the ringleader of the thieves indignantly. 
and told him that since he had taken our food away from us, he might at least give us a place on the bunks. Now just tell me, wasn't that a natural complaint for a city dweller and an, and an officer? And what happened then? The ringleader of the thieves agreed. After all, I was thereby surrendering any claim to the fat bacon, and I was thereby recognizing his superior authority. And I was revealing a point of view in common with his. He, too, would have driven off the weakest, and he gave orders for two of the gray neutrals to get off the lower bunks beside the window and free a space for us. They obeyed submissively, and we lay down in the best places. For a while we still grieved over our loss. The thieves paid no attention to my military breeches. They weren't their kind of uniform. But one of the thieves was already fingering Valentin's woolen trousers. He liked them. And it was only at night that the reproachful whisper of our neighbors reached us. How could we ask the thieves to help us by driving two of our own people under the bunks in our place? And only then did awareness of my own meanness prick my conscience and make me blush. And for many years thereafter I blushed every time I remembered it. The gray prisoners on the lower bunks were my own brothers, 581B, the POWs. Had I not just a short while ago sworn to assume the burden of their fate? And then I had shunted them off under the bunks. True, they hadn't done anything to defend us against the thieves. But why should they have fought for our fat bacon if we ourselves didn't? They had had enough cruel fights back in the POW camps to destroy their faith in decency. But they hadn't done me any harm, and I had them. And thus it is that we have to keep getting banged on the flank and snout again and again, so as to become, in time at least, human beings. Yes, human beings. Have a good day, friends.